I just wanted to um, give a bit of an overview for what might happen um, in the next little while and particularly focusing today on about making equity and if we're working on addressing the trauma that is the high rates of STIs, bloodborne viruses and potential for HIV in our communities and what we're really doing is addressing trauma um, and um, and we're also then really making some headway into not only achieving human rights, but also around um, making our societies more equitable. Because if you do have good sexual and reproductive health, what we are saying to people is that uh, your children upon being born will not experience racism. They will have the same opportunities as every other Australian. You will be welcomed in this society wherever you work. You will have access to all the cultural protective factors that are available to your ancestry, and you will be able to um, grow and expand and contribute not only to this country, but to the rest of the globe. That's what we're actually saying when we're working in addressing the high rates of STIs and HIV and ensuring women and men's fertility beyond um, the current status that we're at. And so I think it's really important to kind of frame it in that way, which is why I wanted to focus a little bit on equity gains. So in this presentation, very quickly, I'm going to run through what does this actually mean for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. I'm going to focus a little bit on this changing role of adolescence. A lot of our um, young people, whilst they're coming to clinics, they're not really engaged um, in, in the way which actually checks their health and well-being during this preconception phase. And then when we're talking about generational equity gains, how are we actually making that happen? A lot of the close the gap work is around achieving health and well-being for all by 2031. What do we actually mean when we say that and how and where do we intervene? And so in terms of equity gains, since 1994, when the Australian and Torres Strait Islander Justice, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Justice Commissioner um, report came out, there was a real move towards framing equity gains as realising people's rights around self-determination, but also it was contextualised in a human rights context. And so in terms of the kinds of inequity that we're experiencing, it really was framed around the ability to have a healthy social functional life and reducing pain, humiliation and dysfunction. Um, and that's what we kind of frame all of our current measures on how we perform in this area around is around deficits. We frame it around dysfunction, we frame it around chaos and our inability to intervene. And a lot of the work that we're doing within our own community context at the moment is around framing it differently, around taking strengths-based approaches, around um, changing the language of deficit to one of strengths and starting to do measures and develop measures in that way. There's a very good initiative happening with the Audi Ordinations at the moment through the Empowered Communities process where they're transforming their current measures from one of deficit to one of strength and ability. And I think then that um, this framing of these issues and equity gain in a human rights context has been a very powerful force that's driven a lot of the national leadership and a lot of the national policy agendas in that way. And so the other considerations that have come through very clearly is that we are a wealthy nation. We can solve a health crisis that affects less than 3% of the population. Uh, we need to implement universally agreed solutions. They are very readily accessible and there's a lot of evidence being generated about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And also then around um, ensuring a good standardisation of comprehensive primary health care services and health infrastructure. There is a focus on eradicating specific diseases, um, but also then taking an ecological approach and really addressing some of the social determinants of health as a way of addressing um, the idea of equity. In terms of how it's looking through a range of the national policy and other portfolios is very clear. Um, equity is around human rights. Um, it's around addressing some of the systemic discrimination. So a recent report from the Human Rights Commission found that 90% of Koori peoples who accessed health services in Victoria experienced a sense of discrimination. Um, how to make meaningful and stated commitment of governance to actually address um, the 20 to 30 year vision that we hold true to ourselves. And that's starting to come through. The cool and bullet, for example, is a long-term strategy. Lots of state governments are working through COAG 
vague frameworks and having a longer term view to addressing some of these issues. And then also from the community sector has been a really strong push to address things in a holistic way. And I think that um, if you look at sexual health but don't consider um, family violence or if you don't consider housing arrangements or if you don't consider just public transportation, for example, then you're not taking the whole picture into an account. And also then um, the new administration of Indigenous Affairs actually does play itself out in very powerful ways in how we're able to develop and deliver services in this, um, in, in the frameworks and with the monies and resources that we've got available. And what we're learning more and more about is the fact that we have to become more resourceful rather than just rely on resources. And so it is around establishing partnerships, collaborations, working working in different kinds of ways through different amalgams and um, thinking laterally and not taking a singular approach to addressing these issues but taking simultaneous actions across different strategies at the same time. So Michael Marmot talked about achieving equity through um, needing an approach that takes in the whole of life, starting with women of childbearing age and focusing on the care of infants and young children. Whilst that's a very good definition, I've just expanded it a little bit. Oh. No, I haven't. What have I done? Yes, I have. And so in terms of that, um, one of the powerful things that I've come to recognise, there's two, two very powerful points. One is that we don't consider early life prior to birth, and so we're missing out on a whole range of developmental opportunities that occur during um, pregnancy and in that preconception phase. The other aspect is that we've made um, the partners of Aboriginal women completely invisible in policy and other contexts. We do not bring men into the into the women's space. We don't encourage them to participate in antenatal classes. We don't count their Aboriginality when they're coming in to um, participate in, in um, our services. Uh, we're, not, we're not respecting them as fathers. We don't, we, we spend a lot of time calling them abusers and pedophiles and bashers and floggers and people who are incarcerated, but we never actually call them as fathers, role models, and really support them along those lines. And, um, and the role of extended family in achieving equity is also a very powerful thing too. And so in terms of that definition around achieving equity, um, if we're truly operating in a cultural way and looking at culturally protective factors, then we need to include the whole of response, and that involves um, people's partners. There is a real movement starting to happen. I'd like to think I had a little bit of something to do with it, um, but challenging this child and maternal health, which is a very biologically driven um, process to having one more of a child and family health. Um, and in terms of equity gain, over the next decade, considering the demographic of our population, young people who are going to be parents in the next decade are going to be the implementers of equity gain. That's where it's going to happen. It's going to happen in our families. And all of our services then need to wrap around and support those families to achieve that. The biggest contributor to our children in out-of-home care at the moment, um, Andrew Jacomos has just finished his audit, is family violence. And our society deserves much better. So sexual health, whilst we talk about STIs and bloodborne viruses, we very rarely, in a service context, match family violence and the experience of that with the outcome of sexually transmitted infections and women's empowerment and a whole range of other strategies that are often just commonplace in international interventions but we don't necessarily do them here. Both women and men will be thrust into parenthood without the knowledge, skills or support they need. We imagine that because someone falls pregnant that they're immediately going to know how to become a parent We've got the greatest rate of child removals occurring up to age one in Victoria. It's not around abuse. The predominant cause is around neglect. Neglect is a manifestation of not knowing adequately the information that's going to empower people during that early life phase. And around the empowerment then that people need to be able to implement it for them by themselves. In terms of that, um, Again, if we really build on men as fathers or uncles or um, people who have a role in an extended family process, then bringing that to the fore, I think, is something that's going to be an enormous equity gain for all of us. It was also critical because 
doing work with young men who've been incarcerated. They've often gone in when their women are pregnant or they've got young kids. When they're coming out, they don't know developmentally what's happened for their children. They find it really hard to engage. I think innovation can occur, for example, is not only treating hepatitis C in prisons or um, dealing with STIs as such, but perhaps part of the discharge planning could be around um, parenting skills for fathers and actually helping them become better fathers upon release from prison, for example. And we do need a new approach to adolescence and to the period of adolescence. Adolescence is under an enormous amount of stress and strain in our communities. Traditionally, it was quite well defined about the transitions between childhood and adulthood. It was a very short space of time, but with participation now in modern Australian society and participation in elongated educational periods of time, um, those issues around sexual debut, becoming a parent, um, having having the capacity to hold children all the way through that pregnancy is something that's really shifting and changing. We don't engage well with adolescents through health services. We do not um, really focus at the moment through our comprehensive primary health care on services that are around early life or aged care. Where mm. we're all getting trapped at the moment is around the experience of midlife disease, around chronic disease like diabetes, um, chronic renal failure, those kinds of midlife chronic diseases are the ones where our services are getting trapped at the moment. That's where the avalanche is actually occurring, uh, occurring and we're not doing the opportunistic requirements that will engage young people. They are coming into the service. They are accessing services at least five times a year. You will have an adolescent in through your door, but we are not doing the opportunistic work that will actually shift the experience of the hyper-endemic nature of STIs that we have in our communities at the moment. We've also got um, different responses happening through different organisations around adolescents. It would make good sense to join together, for example, youth organisations with health services, with um, support agencies, with um, justice health, with a whole range of other initiatives um, to get a comprehensive program together, um, again, to support the equity gains, and also to think about those cultural protective factors. There were very strict roles and responsibilities that our extended families, our rigorous um, relationships established through kinship systems, song lines, dances, um, elders' responsibilities played in helping to facilitate that transition. And our young people are more exposed and more at risk of harm than ever before, not only with the experiences now of, um, of racism um, and also drug and alcohol misuse, but also there are a range of different opportunities happening in global areas and they're interfacing with that all the time. So there is this enormous transition that's occurred in the last three decades around what the experience of adolescence is for most Australians actually, um, but for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, when you've got a system that's worked for 40,000 plus years and you're asking to make this rapid transition, and those transitional periods of time between childhood and adulthood have completely transformed. Um, it's dangerous before it becomes, um, before it becomes um, healthy and your understanding where the equity gain could be. The experiences that I've had in working and engaging with adolescents are many. Um, there are a lot, actually. Um, but we've done surveys through football and netball clubs. There's some wonderful examples that Belinda will probably talk to you about in just a moment, but also through the Rumbalara football network, um, netball clubs. Um, educational services delivered in a variety of settings, so even if children do drop out of school, that that education service actually follows them. Um, innovative service delivery. People need instant gratification. Uh, there is, a, there is a consortium of organisations at the moment who are looking at different point of care interventions with new technologies that allow for diagnosis and treatment to occur within a 20 minute time frame. Unfriggin believable, <laughs> but possible. Um, peer led initiatives are brilliant. We've made comics, we've done a whole range of different things in that space. Um, and what we're finding is that people who've been removed from their families at a young age are in, investing in, in really intense 
uh, relationships at about the age of 15 and all the manifestations of the violence of their early years are playing out in that space and that's what we're bringing children into at the moment. And people want relationship counselling, they want education and support around what a good relationship looks like, how do I know I'm in one. Um, they also want home-based visits and parenting information, so incentivised health-seeking behaviour um, and also then parenting information in their homes is something that's critical. And um, finally, uh, this has come a big one, uh, it's just managing debt through this period of life. Who here's got maxed out credit cards? <coughs> Who here's got a Telstra debt that just keeps on following them and that just keeps on compromising their lives no matter what? There's a whole range of young people out there who've tried to get ahead through debt. They haven't managed it well They've, and it follows them throughout their lives and at the time when they're trying to make decisions about acquiring some assets, it's actually become really very difficult. Just for the people standing up the back, please come and join up the front somewhere, loves, it's fine. We have got... The demographic in Australia, uh, particularly amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, is actually well replicated around the rest of the world. It is the largest number of adolescents ever in the history of our species that are living on the face of the planet at the moment. That just blows my mind. We have got the largest number of 10 to 19 year olds anywhere in the history of humanity. Um, and they're alive right now and they're about to take up leadership roles and run organisations and participate and grow economies and look after the environments in a way that hasn't been seen before. And adolescent health, um, through some of the surveys have been done, is emerging as a really critical area for Aboriginal health workers who have been um, invited to comment around this. And the priority areas, as identified by young people themselves, are around emotional mental health, relationships with family and friends, sexuality and sexual orientation, body image, risk taking and experimentation and the rest. None of it's specifically around the diseases of sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne viruses. However, all of these things do have an impact and I think people are wanting us to engage with them in whole of life issues rather than whole of disease issues. For our mob, what we're likely to suffer from is ill health. We have risky or unhealthy behaviours. Um, we're increasingly more likely to be inactive and to have poor diet. We're less likely to access education beyond year 10. We are less likely to have access to safe housing, access to safe supplies or contraception, or access to health services during adolescence than at any other period in their lives. These are isolated young people who are out there trying to make decisions about how to live a life. And they're asking us as a society to make space for them in a way that we're not prepared to accommodate yet. In terms of some of the ways in which we can intervene, certainly um, the work that I'm doing in the first thousand days, which is looking from conception to age two, is a critical period of time. There's been enough international evidence, um, health um, laureate, Nobel, oh goodness me, laureate, health economists around the world, bloody high up ones, <laughs> say, say that it's absolutely fantastic to do this work. There is societal gains if you're actually able to, um, to address issues through that early period of life. But the best time to talk about pregnancy is when you're not, as it turns out. And so the phase just before falling pregnant is actually a really important time to get things right. And in Australia, um, it's, we're taking on much more of a holistic intervention rather than just focusing on, um, on nutrition. Uh, we've already started to engage with Shepherd and our Yorta Yorta Nations actually as a region. Um, we're looking at Western Melbourne. There's um, some initiatives, there's some information up on the back tables around community governance and strengthening families during that period of life. Um, that's the next symposium happening on the 27th. You're more than welcome to come along to that. And the goal is to provide coordinated comprehensive interventions to address people's issues during that time. And that is so that we can increase the capacity for kids to participate well in school support parents to do it. That's the information about that save the date flyer. If you want to take a photo, you'll have to be quick, otherwise they're up there on the back table. Three, two, one, you're done. Okay, the other thing is about um, identifying our elites and building them up. Currently, our very, very smart, very, very competent, capable kids are kind of cruising in the mid-range of a classroom. 
they're doing enough not to fail, they're just doing enough not to pass or excel, that's not good enough. Whilst we've welfareized the whole healthcare system in addressing deficits and vulnerable kids, what we as leaders need to also be doing is identifying our elites and supporting parents of those elite kids to help them be elites and create pathways and build capacity for their resourcefulness. They will need to earn at least six or seven numbered figures per year in order to help lift us into the next class and to help build the middle class underneath them. They need to, and we're starting to see that happen through supply nations and the like. People are starting to own big companies now and really make their marks in entrepreneurial activities. We've got 20,000 of us participating in higher education through universities, which is great. So we're building a professional class, but we actually need people to start earning big money to help that facilitate that transition. And strangely, if you've got some monies around you, then you're doing much more than surviving. You're actually thriving. And those people as role models are absolutely essential. And I'm really grateful to our organisations like the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, CATS and AM, um, the dental associations and the like, who've really helped to build that workforce up in, and really support that kind of um, pathway through. That's been incredibly important. The other thing that we need to do is address family violence. This is, quite frankly, putting kids into care and institutionalising them at the time when they actually need to be in families and being supported. And I think preconception has a lot to make. Um, we can make some enormous changes if we're addressing family violence and getting the understanding about what constitutes a good relationship, first of all, with ourselves, but then with our others, I think, is a really important thing to do. So addressing family violence, um, at the moment you might see in The Age, Andrew Jackamoss, who is the Commissioner for Aboriginal Kids here in Victoria, has just put out a release saying that there are Aboriginal women who are imprisoned because there is nowhere safe for them to go as a result of family violence. They are being incarcerated for petty crime. You can look it up now online. The Age, Andrew Jackamoss, Family Violence, Incarceration of Women. That is a systematic failure. Addressing ice use in communities. One of the major precipitating factors in the work that I'd done with Access House around homelessness, around entry into um, drug and alcohol rehab, around the experience of family violence is absolutely around ice use. And I know it's the next big thing, it used to be heroin. I know people in emergency services are saying, gee whiz, just bring back those old heroin days, this ice stuff is crazy. Um, but um, we need to find some way to actually help people create a different sense of significance for themselves. Um, and we need to build capacity for mandatory reporting. A lot of our communities now are absolutely suffering in fear, um, don't want to report, our healthcare providers don't want to report because it's all a bit challenging, but children's safety needs to come first and that in itself is a huge equity gain. Again, addressing hyperendemic STIs and bloodborne viruses, that's what we're all here for. Um, innovate people, be crazy, go out there on a limb. I know that researchers, organisations don't fund multiple strategies running at the same time. We're very focused on single interventions, but not all of us think like that. Um, and all of us are starting to transform the research institutions that we're looking to build evidence through to acknowledge the power of, um, of interventions being run simultaneously. I think that there is opportunistic services that can be provided, particularly to adolescents. We've got to get our universal services in place and running smoothly in a coherent way. And we're building the capacity of the next generation of researchers. And I see some of them in the room here now, so it's a really wonderful thing. Um, we also need strong political advocates and really strong service deliverers who take this seriously. And we need to build capacity for parenthood. These are the people who will implement the equity gain. It will not be us. We are services. I did all right by my kids, nearly killed me. I would have preferred a bit of support around me at the time. And that's where the actual, that's where the point of intervention needs to come. They are not our kids. If you're a service provider, child protection worker, and you're referring to children in care, they are not your kids. 
our kids do blah, blah. No, they're not your kids. They're the kids of parents who are not coping, who are not ready, who are not informed, they are not engaged, they're not educated, and they need some, they've probably got cognitive issues, mental health issues, emotional issues. They are living unsafe lives. That's where the intervention needs to happen. I'm sorry it's harder, but if we're going to lift this in the next two decades, and if we're not going to let this continue on and watch our deterioration of our culture on one level and watch just a small group of us uh, rise above it all, then this is what it means to do an equity game. It's the hard yards right now. We also need to make sure that young men have people to talk to about sexual and reproductive health care. Crazy idea, isn't it? What we do is treat people as vectors of disease. If we clear the disease up, that's going to be OK. But actually talking about them, about their social roles and responsibilities in a cultural context is actually just much more powerful. And thinking about the fact that they might need some reproductive health care too is also really essential. And that's probably it for me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kerry.